one guy would advance things to a certain point, like Einstein, and then someone like Niels Bohr comes along and goes, hey Albert, how about this? And then Niels Bohr thinks he's got it all, and then some grad student somewhere goes, actually, uh, this. And, and it just keeps unfold, but I guess that's ever the case of science. Yeah, that's really the nature of the subject. You'll have vanguard, you know, you have these renegades, you know, who come up with new ideas that shake the foundations of our understanding. And after a while, if there's enough experimental evidence, those cutting edge ideas become accepted. They become the commonplace description. And then it takes a new thinker at the edge of exploration to say, well, hang on, this is where these ideas and this data and these observations take us next. You know, Einstein was a revolutionary thinker when it came to space, time, and relativity. But he did not warm to quantum mechanics. In a sense, that was perhaps too revolutionary for him. And it took other minds that w would be able to advance the subject further. And Niels Bohr uh, hated the idea of the multiverse. Yes, Niels Bohr was one of the pioneers of quantum mechanics, which truly shattered previous ways of thinking about how the universe worked. Nevertheless, when certain puzzles in quantum mechanics arose that even Niels Bohr couldn't really answer, he was not open to some of the more radical suggestions of, say, Hugh Everett, who you were referring to in 1957 in Princeton. He was a graduate student studying the math of quantum mechanics and found, look, if quantum mechanics says there's a 30% probability of an electron being here and a 70% chance of it being over there, how do we go from those probabilities to the fact that when you look at the world, when you measure the world, you always see one outcome? Where do the probabilities go? And his resolution was the most straightforward mathematically. He said, they don't go away, they go into other universes. In one universe, you will find the electron here. In another universe, you will find the electron there. There'll be two of you, each thinking there's a single universe, each being incorrect in your view of reality. Niels Bohr, when he heard about this way of dealing with the probabilistic approach of quantum mechanics, said, no way. This is absolute nonsense. He would not hear of it. Now, we still don't know if this is the right approach. It is a viable one. People study it intensively. There are other approaches that people have also put forward. But right now, 2011, we're still uncertain about this very basic feature of quantum mechanics, how to go from the fuzzy probabilities of the math to the definite reality of observation. It seems there are like two sets of tests going on, on the, one on the macro and one on the sub-micro scale. That's exactly right. The Large Hadron Collider in Geneva, Switzerland is one promising way to try to test ideas like string theory. And it's a fairly barbaric approach, really. What you do is you slam particles together at, at incredibly high speed, and you examine in detail what comes out of those collisions. And you hope that some of the stuff that comes out of those collisions is stuff that the math of string theory predicts should be there. There are, for instance, a class of particles called supersymmetric particles that are a natural ingredient from the mathematics of string theory. We've never seen these particles. Will we see them at the Large Hadron Collider? Many of us hope so. If we do, that will be a nice piece of circumstantial evidence that the math is describing the real world. The other end of the spectrum, as you note, is to undertake astronomical observations. That may seem a strange place to try to confirm a theory that deals with little tiny vibrating filaments, these little tiny strings of string theory. But this is actually work that I've been deeply involved in. It's possible that the strings in the early universe might have left a little imprint on the young universe, sort of like if you have a, a shrivel balloon and you write a little message on the outside in a fine tip pen so small that you can't see it, but if the balloon expands when you blow air, air into it, your little message will expand too. You'll be able to read it much more easily on the expanded balloon. Similarly, we believe that the universe, since it's undergone billions of years of cosmic expansion, space has swelled, the little imprints of string theory may yield observable consequences in the sky if we know what to look for. So I, I got through Multiverses, M brain, super string, and then I hit um, a holographic universe, and I think that's when my brain exploded. The holographic universe, as I describe in the book, I do agree is the strangest of all multiverse scenarios. It basically says that just as a thin piece of plastic with appropriate etches and swirls, a traditional hologram, when illuminated correctly, creates a three dimensional image. 
Our three-dimensional reality may actually be more properly described and encoded as processes taking place on a distant, thin, bounding surface. And we, everything we see in the world around us, is just the holographic projection of those processes. That is a deeply unfamiliar idea. It is one that many physicists have still struggle with. I still struggle to get my head around it, but it does naturally emerge from the study of black holes and the study of string theory. So it is an idea that I think we have to get used to. Where's the cutting edge right now? Where's, where's the most interesting stuff happening uh, in this realm? Well, a lot of work is being done on this holographic idea to try to build up the mathematical structure for it so we can make potentially some testable predictions. And indeed, some predictions have emerged from this mathematics that are being tested in upstate New York, or I should say more Long Island, the Relativistic Heavy Ion Collider, it's called RIC in Long Island, where gold atoms are slammed together at very high speed, not individual protons, gold atoms. And in those fairly messy collisions, there are predictions that come from this holographic perspective that people are beginning to test. And so far, it looks pretty good for the predictions of this idea. People are still on the fence as to whether that really means there are holographic versions of what we see around us, or whether it's just a powerful mathematical trick that allows us to get some numbers that match observations. But it's exciting that these far out ideas are actually making some contact with observations. The book is The Hidden Reality, Parallel Universes and the Deep Laws of the Cosmos. I've been speaking with the author Brian Green and The Hidden Reality, published by Knopf.